Hello. Don't know about you, but um, I think it's really important to have a goal in life. Recently, my goal has become what I call the gold pill glow. And I call it that because it comes out of experience when I was going through the whole red pill rage thing. So I was looking to move out of that into something uh, happier and something deeper and more contented. I was looking for something that I could find more long-term fulfillment in. And being in red pill rage wasn't didn't look like to me like it was a good long-term strategy. Like many men have experienced going through a divorce, going through a red pill rage, and then we feel like, okay, after a while, we feel like, well, where do I go from here? Where do I go that's beyond that? Where can I go and inside myself and in my life that is more pleasing than being in a state of rage? So as I was going through my divorce and I was experiencing all sorts of anger and frustration and feelings of unfairness and so as I was going through my divorce and having all these raging angry feelings I was doing what many men do nowadays I guess so um, looking for others that have been through the same experience and looking for well what did they do how did they move forward from their life and how did they work with this and how did they process it and like many men I watched a lot of videos you know poking fun or raging against various things that members of the other gender have <laughs> said about this or that. So anyway, so like most men, I went through that. Explored the manosphere and online forums and various YouTube videos and began to look at my own life experience as well as the work I do myself with forgiveness and various things like that. Set up a non-profit that promotes forgiveness in like over 25 different languages. And so there's lots of stuff I do. So I was already doing that when I get hit with this divorce thing. So that helped me through. That was one of the things that helped me. And many things I discovered in the manosphere really helped me. Most of you are probably familiar with what red pill rage is. It just simply put, we could just call it the angry stage of what a man goes through when he wakes up to the fact that Life doesn't work the way we were taught that it worked. And you can do the right thing and play by the rules and still be treated very unfairly. Find yourself in a very painful place. However, a lot of good has come out of that for me. What the whole divorce thing forced me to do was really to look at my own inner resources, as well as finding resources online, building up my network of friends. Rather than feeling lonely, it's shifting towards feeling more like a happy alone time. It's actually kind of nice to have time and space to myself and not have drama going on and just have contentment. I really place a much higher value on contentment. That brings us to what is gold pill glow? And I would say that's one of the core aspects for me of, of uh, gold pill glow, the sense of contentment. And there's other parts of it. So I'd like to get into those and maybe you can relate to some of these. For me, gold pill glow is a sense of happiness, um, a sense of peace and a sense of freedom and a sense of ease and being able to navigate through life and through the challenges of life in a constructive way. So life still has challenges, it still has opportunities, yet I'm kind of more detached from the process and can observe it and can engage with it in constructive ways. So whatever is happening, I'll kind of find ways of of using it to, to grow my character, to develop myself, and to be engaged in life with whatever happens, and I turn it towards the good. Whatever's going on, I turn it. To, how can I turn this towards the good? How can I make the best of it? How can I move forward from here? And even if I'm going through a, a, a process of disillusionment, to see that as a positive thing, because having an illusion is not a good thing. So being disillusioned, though it might be painful, can be uh, a very constructive thing because it takes us to a greater state of awareness and a, st a greater aliveness in the long term. So what are the other elements of achieving and maintaining the goal pill goal? So I would say that the elements that help me achieve and maintain the goal pill goal are, and uh, now I'll be very interested in knowing what you do, but this is what I do. Uh, one aspect that really strikes me is when I was looking at the whole thing in the manosphere is this element of brotherhood. Yeah, as I was looking around at these various forums and content in YouTube and uh, various things like that, I noticed that there's a real strong sense of brotherhood in the men's movement. 
and it's very heartening and very heartwarming you know, because you can, you can see men really out to genuinely help other men whether it's in the forums or comments on YouTube videos or what, wanting to make sure that other men don't go through the same painful situation that they've gone through or if other men are going through that to help them out of it and to realize they're not alone. It's a wonderful thing this brotherhood that's going on amongst men because usually we kind of tend to grow up with a sense that other men are competition. It's competition for sort of like scarce resources or a particular woman or what have you. Um, although I've had, you know, obviously had friends in my life, a lot of it was quite superficial. You couldn't really have a deep conversation or <laughs> something that really mattered to you with most of the men that I knew. We might be kind of drinking buddies or sports buddies or whatever, but there was never really much of a open-hearted conversation about what's really going on. So I find this co contrasting thing of, of men really helping other men and really reaching out on deep issues, issues that really matter. I find that a really good sign. In fact, it makes me wonder whether and actually a man can actually have a healthy relationship with a woman unless he has a good experience of brotherhood because otherwise it all becomes about the woman, it all be everything becomes about that relationship and it just becomes like a tree with only one root, you know, not a strong position to be in. You become much too intertwined, enmeshed and uh, caught up in that particular one relationship. So I think the whole brotherhood thing, wherever we go with it and whatever a man decides beyond that, that to have that element of brotherhood is really a key, really an essential part. And it's a really important element, I feel, to the whole gold pill glow, to feel that there are other men around that will cover your back in a sense. It may be only for one tiny aspect of your life, and you might never have met them, but you can interact in a way which is meaningful. So there's more or less like a collective sense of we're all in it together and let's help each other out. We can be there. We can use to relate to each other in ways that are constructive and meaningful. As men, we've been sold or have bought into this idea or myth that romance is what's going to make us happy of finding the one and this special woman and the mixed uh, results, shall we say, on <laughs> trying to find a particular woman and then being happy. And I've done a whole video on this romantic love and illusion and trying to get to the other side of that without getting starry-eyed about romance or bitter-eyed about romance is just seeing what's really going on there. One of the things that helps counteract that is a sense of bonding and connection with other men and even being able potentially to create a, a brotherhood connection with, with women. So I think the sense of brotherhood can help free us from the romantic illusion because when we fixate on romance and the one it makes us isolated and it makes us weak because resilience comes not by just being able to stand alone. You know, this other illusion that people fall into is, I don't need anybody. Everybody needs other people. It's a fact of life, and we need to learn to get on with other people. And I find that um, most of the men I know, and, and myself too, are really challenged around trying to make friends with other men. We, there's lots of advice around dating and relating, but it's very little about how do you actually make a healthy bond with another man. We don't grow up in tribal societies anymore. So many of us live in a sense of isolation and a sense of it's me against the world and then trying to find somebody to bond with. So it's us two as a couple against the world. And that kind of attitude, I think, is counterproductive. And it's better to operate with a feeling of how can I create healthy connections with other men? How do I engender good friendships? Because I've noticed with some of the men I know that they make a fuss about how nice it is to connect and to do something or whatever it is we're doing. But they don't actually pick up the phone and show the initiative themselves. It's like many guys hold back from that. It's like they'll be charging around trying to connect with women, but they don't show any initiative to be connecting with other men. It's alien to a lot of some of the guys I know of not really knowing how to create friendships with other men. And... Um, you know, beer buddies is one thing, uh, that's not too difficult, and, and it's often that's how friendship starts. You have to take risks in life in order to get something. So in making friends with other men, we need to take risks. That's just how it is. We have to... So the thing is, is to not need to pretend to feel different from how you feel. It doesn't mean we need to go into floods of tears with, with another guy. That Do that with a therapist or a counsellor. 
but you can just say, look, oh yeah, I'm feeling gutted because such and such happened if, and I feel this and I feel that. Many men would just get really uncomfortable or embarrassed if we went any further than that, but at least you can say that and not pretend you're feeling any better than you do. So uh, the irony is part of the path to gold pill glow is to be able to be honest about what's bugging you or what's annoying you, what's hurting you with other appropriate people. It needs to be people that are appropriate. See how you feel and then if they don't ask you about it, just move on. That's a bit as much as they can handle. So if you're saying, oh, I'm feeling really gutted because this woman dumped me or whatever. Tell me, you know, they don't indicate that they want to know more. You just change the subject. But at least you've said how you feel. Being able to have a, like, have a connection with other people, especially other men, actually makes us more resilient. Because um, hum as human beings, as a species, we evolved as tribes. That's how we evolved. We didn't evolve as isolated family units. We evolved as tribes and that because that's a much more resilient and adaptable social structure than just family units or single individuals as even. We're sociable animals really. We need to be able to connect with our people. You know, it's good to cultivate independence but it's a shared independence, more like an interdependence. We have our own strengths but we offer them to others and we accept the strengths of others and how they can help us. Um, so it's a win-win. If we don't do that, if we're not willing to network and connect with others, then that the outcome is that is loneliness, isolation, and depression. And unless somebody really has some deep spiritual connection or some kind that can pull them out of the normal psychological state, kind of social isolation can lead somebody to really low psychological states. The nuclear family, as we know it in the West, the way probably virtually all of us grew up in some shape or form where it was dysfunctional or functional. It's not the only way of doing it, as you probably know. In some tribal societies, the women have their hut, the men have their hut, and the kids stay with the women until they reach about puberty, and then they're initiated into that man's world. They become initiated into um, what it is to be a man and how to hunt and all of that. So they get taught. Other men mentor them and teach them. They teach them all sorts of skills, presumably all to do with how to find a mate, as well as how to catch fish and all the, and the usual things. So they don't just teach them physical skills of survival, they also teach them social skills. But most of us as guys didn't have somebody to mentor us. So many of us have, didn't have somebody who could really mentor us in a deep way and we feel we could trust and there was a large chunk of human evolution where that or something similar took place where it was tribes we basically have a lot of the instincts and wiring to function well. And so when we begin to look at bonding with other men in a, in a broader way and getting beyond the nuclear family, you might find there's actually instinctive parts of you that will waken up and start to function. It will make your life happier and more fulfilling and much easier than you realize because those instincts are all there. That's wiring for being in a tribe inside you. The wiring for being tribal is inside us. You never know what kind of tribal instincts might waken up inside you and you find out that actually you get much more fulfillment than you realized you would or expected you would from certain types of social connections and certain types of social situations. And that becomes more obvious as we become more honest to ourselves about how do we feel about life in this moment? Do we have a sense of well-being or do we have a sense of suffering? And the more ability we have to be honest with ourselves about where that state is and not just struggle, struggle, struggle and looking for something better to happen down the line. But to get out, get out of that struggle mode and be able to get into enjoyment of life in the moment, then we become much more able to find ways where we can enjoy life in the moment and uh, much more able to bond with other people who are into this stepping out of the struggle. Learn to just break out of seeing other men so much as competition and seeing how you can cooperate. Now, to some extent, some of us learn that there's often a, you know, an undercurrent of competition in that kind of connection. So having friendly competition, any competitiveness, trying to make it a bit friendly and um, not being in a scarcity mentality where you're in competition with other men for scarce resources, it's not a good foundation for a happy life. But beginning to see life as more abundant and how we can create good stuff together because as a society that's what we do. We create a lot of things together that are really good and sometimes we inadvertently create a lot of things together that are not so good. So being able to do more of the good and less of the not so good. <laughs>
Another key I feel to to having the gold pill glow is having some ongoing self-development going on. For one thing, it's difficult to be happy in an unhappy body, so we need to take care of our health, eating right, exercising right, all that good stuff. But not from a sense, reluctant sense of, oh, I have to do this, but more like looking at the benefits it provides and then doing it in a positive, constructive way because, you, you know, you're after those benefits. You want to take exercise, you want to work out, you want to do all that because you're really enjoying the benefits and you want more of those benefits or you're anticipating those benefits. So it's not such a, a rule or a should to or a have to. It's more like want to. It really helps motivate us if we look at the benefits something's going to give us. Then it's easier to get ourselves to sign up with the program to do whatever it takes, you know, to get ourselves into a, a happy space of well-being and, uh, and, con and contentment and positive purpose. And for different people, of course, it's going to be different things. Some people want to become successful in the world, and fair enough. But if it goes too far, then that can really detract us from being able to take time to smell the flowers and enjoy the beauty of life. So a key element is how much stuff do you really need? Finding ways to get the stuff you need that doesn't feel like a struggle or striving or, you know, a little bit for a time is okay. But if it really takes the the fun out of life, it really takes the enjoyment out of life and turns life into a treadmill. And I think it's time to really look at, well, what's really my kind of motivation here? What's really my goals? What's really my priorities? And, uh, and balance those out. As you well know, most of us in the Western world have got a lot more stuff and are not necessarily any happier than people in the uh, developing world. In fact, there's a lot of people who are a lot happier than we are with a lot less stuff than we've got. So are we missing something there, you know? How to find, find a balance, finding your own balance. And nobody can tell you what that is, of course. So you maybe really want to go for it and really become um, successful in the world and um, for a certain period of time. But watch, it doesn't go too far because there's no point wrecking your mental health or your physical health in order to achieve a goal so that you're going to be happy when you retire. Because a lot of people burn themselves out trying to get themselves in a position where they can retire happily and are miserable. Their health is gone or they've cultivated habits of and attitudes of mind that really don't support them being happy because they've, they've cultivated habits of struggle and striving that they don't know how to relax after a while. After a while, they just don't know how to switch off and enjoy life. So there's always got to be this element of knowing how and when to switch off and enjoy life. If we don't use it, we lose it. But you don't want it to be that by the time you get to 50, 60 or 70, you've lost any capacity to enjoy life and only know how to struggle and strive. But just be careful about finding a balance between making in the world and making yourself happy in the day-to-day -day life. Where's your, where's your balance there? How much stuff do you need? How much stuff can you do with that? Because it reaches the point where stuff becomes a responsibility and you're responsible for that stuff. Your, your life becomes about looking after the stuff you've got. So self-development with a balance between making it in the world and making yourself happy in a day-to-day -day basis. And part of what some men struggle with is this idea of wanting to be an alpha male. As you probably know, the whole alpha male thing turns out to be a bit of a misconception anyway. It came out of analysing the behaviour of wolves and actually making some wrong assumptions about what was going on there. But nevertheless, it's become a useful handle for Alpha male has become a useful handle for describing certain types of male behavior which are said to be attractive to the females of, the, of our species. Because um, what they find is anyway is that most males are alpha in some situations and are non-alpha in our situations. Labeling ourselves as men as either alpha or beta is very limiting and it can be useful if you want to recognize, okay, I could maybe develop more qualities. It can be a useful handle for describing certain qualities. Building an identity around labels is uh, thin ice. You're walking in thin ice as soon as we start to build a, our identity and who we think we are around labels because we need to have the flexibility and resilience to flow with whatever's going on. And sometimes we might want to really boldly take the lead and other times we might want to just go along <laughs> wherever else is doing. So don't build an identity where you always have to be alpha or, or you're always stuck in beta you are who you are and, and um, cultivate yourself in the ways you want, not because somebody else says this is the way to go, because not everybody can be alpha because then nobody's alpha.
One of the important concepts of this is there's a, some serious misunderstandings of even what a genuine alpha male role is. For example, in many warrior cultures, it wasn't just about fighting. It wasn't just about a man's ability to use the weapons of the day to maximum effect. There was also other aspects of life. For example, the samurai, they were also into artistic things. They were into calligraphy and an appreciation of art and uh, appreciation of beauty. And um, so it wasn't just like that um, a warrior is only about the fighting side of it. That would have been seen as very primitive. There was a, this element of being a, a well-rounded character. They knew only too well that if, uh, if a warrior was only one-sided and knew, only knew about weapons, then he wouldn't know anything about diplomacy and would get a lot of people unnecessarily killed because he only knew about fighting everybody. So they knew that um, a one-sided person who only focuses on the uh, aggressive side and doesn't as learn to assert softer aspects. So in most of those cultures, there was always a balance between developing the hard qualities like boldness and courage and developing the, the soft qualities like appreciation of art and being able to take time out, being able to be reflective. It was also encouraged. It was because, uh, as I say, anybody who, who was a leader of men who didn't have that kind of level of refinement would end up just getting a lot of people of their tribe or their society would end up getting them killed in unnecessary wars and unnecessary battles. There's a problem with the whole alpha thing is it's seen as being the aggressive assertive aspect of the masculine rather than the softer reflective aspects of the masculine and we need both those aspects. Become a pain in the ass to everybody if you don't develop those other qualities. So. So when it's time to be aggressive and assertive, you be aggressive and assertive. But when it's not time to be aggressive and assertive, you're kind of fun, you know, <laughs> relax, chill out. Now as we learn to let go, or we look at letting go of red pill rage, it helps if we understand what's useful about it and why it's attractive to stay in it for a while. And then if we can find other ways to get the benefits that the rage gives us without having to have the rage. Because <laughs> rage is not a fun state to be in a long term, in a long time. And it feels a bit toxic after a while and you kind of, okay, I want something else. You need something more constructive, love of life in some kind of way. The, the rage in a way is acting as a reminder not to make the same mistake again. So it's a wake up call. Of, our boundaries have been disturbed. Important boundary in terms of uh, values or beliefs or ideas that have been infringed. And we're readjusting those ideas. We're readjusting our boundaries and things. And um, we can be using the rage to remind us not to make the same mistake again. Because while we're in rage, we're less likely to make that same mistake again. Because every time we think about the situation, wow, the rage goes on. So what we need is other ways to avoid making the same mistakes but don't involve rage. And that's where greater awareness comes in. So we need to translate our experience into wisdom. Preferably not bitterness, because bitterness isn't wisdom. And preferably not cynicism, because cynicism isn't wisdom. But into wisdom. So what are the, the nuggets of wisdom that we can derive from experience? Only you can decide what nuggets those are for you. But um, things to look at are assumptions you had about life where you go through some of the aspects of, of this video. You may get some ideas and clues as to some assumptions you had about life or about yourself or about the person you were with that were completely wrong, that you fabricated basically. And with encouragement from society around you, some ideas around marriage and relationships and what that was all about, they were completely untrue. Or you may have seen some things in the other person that just were not there. We look for our idealized female in a woman and she might not be the ideal, but we see the ideal. We can't see her because we're so busy looking at the ideal. We're not seeing the person that's really there. So it's a way of maturing as an individual. Whatever challenges we face, we can use it to build our character and become more wise and more mature as an individual and let that become the goal. So the goal becomes switching to wisdom, um, to using it to cultivate wisdom. And through the wisdom, we can be more into the goal pill glow because wisdom is an important aspect of that glow of this capacity to turn our experiences into wisdom 
we learn not to not to be, get too heavy and judgmental about ourselves, not to get into a lot of self-blame and self-criticism, and not even particularly get into a lot of blame and criticism of other people, including people of the other gender. We don't need to get into a whole lot of heavy stuff around them. Become more self-referencing because we begin to define ourselves in reaction to other people, but the other people are still defining us. It's still we're letting them define who we are because we're in reaction, reaction to them. I am not this. I'm not going to do this again. I'm not, well, okay, but that's okay as a start. But wh what do you want to do then? What do you want to create? What's a positive way of framing who you are and who you're becoming rather than framing yourself as in a negative framing things in the positive rather than the negative, framing things in a context of, of who we are becoming rather than who, who we're not <laughs> going to be anymore. But we all go through this phase of, okay, I'm not this anymore, in order to begin to clarify, well, what am I then? Who am I? So part of that can become finding a philosophy that supports you in that, a belief system that supports you in that, ideas that support you in that, going through the, 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 the buffet, buffet meal of that's available on the kind of manosphere and finding things that are outside of that too, philosophies and ideas that support you, support this new emerging you, this, this new you that you didn't really know before because you were focused on making it in the world and supporting your family and da da da. And now it's about, okay, so but who are you outside of all that? So gradually, bit by bit, uh, we can learn to let go of the rage as we find things that we can trust and trust ourselves in staying with a new level of awareness and a new level of consciousness and a new way of, way of looking at life, well, we're not likely to make the same mistakes again. We've got a belief system or a philosophy, concept of ourselves and an image of ourselves that becomes strong enough that we don't need to rage anymore and can more and more rely on the glow <laughs> and the happy, peaceful states and get more into the goal pill, glow way of, of relating to life. And I'm just using the term gold pill glow as a handle on another, as another state that doesn't have so much, so much redness about it. It's got more of a, a peaceful, happy serenity, contentment about it. Mostly of what men complain about in women, and mostly about what women complain about in men, has to do with the biological imperative as it moves through the biology of each of us. So as the biology of as the biologic imperative moves through men and affects their behavior, it also moves through women and affects their behavior. The goal of the biologic imperative is to maintain the species, is to make sure the, the species continues. So that's obviously a good thing. Uh, however, it turns us into a biological robot. So um, say, for example, you're a 17-year-old guy and you're heterosexual and you see a particular set of attractive features in a female, the biological imperative fires up. So you feel like, oh, I'm attracted to this woman, I'm attracted to this female, I want to do certain things to and with this female. And you feel it's you, it's me that wants to do this. You have an identity, you build an identity. Oh, this is me, I'm having these feelings. This is me, this is what I want to do. I will find satisfaction and fulfillment in doing certain things with this, this person. However, it's really the biological imperative if it wasn't for the biological imperative, you wouldn't be feeling any of those things. So is it really you? <laughs> so we feel like it's me that wants to do this, but is it really me that wants to do this? Because it's, it's all these hormones firing up and all these feelings associated with them that make us want to do these things. And before, like when we were like seven year old, we might have found the female of the species completely uninteresting or even an annoyance. Then we hit 14, whatever, and all of a sudden they become very interesting. That's because the, that aspect of the biological imperative is powered up. And then when we get, you know, they're more like my age, which I'm 67, you know, it's not quite so important as it was. It's still important, but not quite so important as it was. I don't identify anything like with that part of me as strongly as I used to. So I could identify it not as strongly as I did before. So which part of us is me? You know, which part of it is you? Was it the you that wasn't interested when you were a seven-year-old? The part of you is really intensely interested when you were 17? Or the part of you is going to maybe be interested but not quite so intensely interested when like you're 67 years old? What is our identity? What, who are we outside of this biological imperative? So when a man is really driven by the biological imperative, he tends to become a bit of a seed spreader 
but um, I think that's partly untrue because I think there's only a certain percentage of men, maybe about 20%, who actually are intentionally want to be intentionally into the seed spreading thing. And about 80% of guys are actually looking for somebody to settle down with, which is normally considered true. But men, oh, men like to, you know, spread it around. It's only true for some men and only for part of the time. But at a point, there comes a point when a guy probably feels like more likely to want to settle down. And whether that is applicable in the modern era <laughs> and the things that are going on in the, in the family courts and all of that is a whole other matter. But nevertheless, that's been the historical pattern and the historical context that we have certain sets of behavior that come from the biological imperative. And especially when we're our teens and we build an identity, we build a sense of who we are around this biological imperative. Also, historically, though, things have happened within culture to try and offset that. Like, it could be a religious structure, a philosophical structure, like Stoicism um, was one kind of philosophical structure that uh, men used to use and now are increasingly using to try and offset being driven by the biological imperative and learning to function outside of it. So things like religion and philosophy, ethical things, have arisen within human society so that we're not purely driven by the biological imperative. So that tent has tended to somewhat reduce the male propensity to seed spread and it tends to somewhat offset the tendency in the women to hypergamy. So, but now a lot of this, the restraints are coming off with the emergence of various dating apps. So you're seeing the extremes of the biological imperative acting out and people react also reacting to that and think, wait a minute, this is crazy. Some people are jumping in and go, wow, I'm loving this, this is great. Now people think, oh, this is a great, this is the decline and fall of the of the Western culture because you know, it's unsustainable. Guys are losing interest in marriage and long term relationships, and women are wondering what's going on, and and um, so there's creating all sorts of confusion and social disruption, and and all the more reason to begin to return to center and begin to find some guiding star, some guiding light to take you through these times and finding some ways to to cultivate contentment and centeredness and because the problem with the whole biological imperative thing is that people can't always tell the difference between excitement and love so they're convinced they're looking for love but actually what they're looking for is excitement because what happens is when the biological imperative when somebody gets excited it feels like they're falling in love. That's the falling in love experience. So, you know, you see somebody across a crowded room or whatever it is, ding! That's a biological imperative, being excited and firing off all sorts of hormones to bing, 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 bing. And you go, ah, oh, she's the one, or at least the one for tonight, or whatever it is. And it's only later in life that we begin to, you know, for most people, we begin to discover what love is about. The problem with the biological imperative is when we feel attracted to somebody and there's this rush of hormones, it doesn't have the sophistication to notice that this person we're having this biological rush with, <laughs> this falling in love with, might actually be totally crazy, <laughs> maybe, maybe bipolar, maybe socially dysfunctional, maybe totally unsuitable for a, as a long-term partner. Uh, maybe totally unsuitable in many ways it doesn't have a lot level of sophistication it's only uh, oh suitable mating material bing fire up the hormones yay and see what happens we learn the hard way <laughs> the, 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 the biological imperative can't be totally relied on <laughs> to find us an appropriate partner so but as I say a lot of people especially when we're younger we, we, we mistake the excitement the excited state of the biological imperative excited state of our biology and we mistake that for love but as I say people say they're looking for love but what they're looking for is a repetitive experience of the biological imperative and then what happens is when they're in a kind of longer term relationship with somebody the biological stimulation settles down through becoming accustomed to that person we're with we either need to learn to switch to love or the relationship will end if we don't learn to cultivate love, genuine love for that person um, the lack of excitement all the person will decide, oh, I'm not happy because the biological imperative is no longer being stimulated in them and they don't have the resources within themselves 
to reach the next level, which is a kind of loving space. And so they end up, oh, I need more excitement. And they start looking for somebody else. And our good reason to be able to see ourselves as being functioning outside of and being more than the biological imperative. So we can learn to cultivate a genuine love for other people. And that ties back into the whole brotherhood thing, because it doesn't have to be, love doesn't have to be a gushy thing. It can be goodwill. It can be uh, genuine caring for other people. It can be helping other people. So there's many shapes that that kind of love can take. So if you're willing to get somebody's back, whether you call it love or not, that's a form of love. Even if it's just a sense of duty or just a sense this is the right thing to do, I think it qualifies as being this broader sense of love. It certainly qualifies as something being broader than just the biological imp imperative trying to get us to mate with some female. So the biological imperative is certainly not a bad thing. It's a good thing, but it's just limited in its perceptions. It's limited in its responses. And so it's very good at helping us recognize suitable mate for being able to conceive and to carry healthy offspring. There's no taking account where she's greedy, manipulative, devious, cunning, um, um, controlling, <laughs> whatever. The biological imperative doesn't have the mechanisms for being able to figure out whether this person is a suitable partner in the long term or not. So we're only listening to the biological imperative and its signals. And those signals can be incredibly strong, then uh, we could be getting ourselves into trouble. So it's important to remember that a biological imperative it affects not just only our drives, it affects our moods, our emotions particularly, and, and the thoughts that arise from those. It's not like just it's a physical, physiological thing. It's affecting our whole emotional mood state and our, um, how we're feeling about ourselves and how we're feeling about life. And so it all fires up. So it's quite a profound experience that's going on. But we need to be able to recognize, but without being down on it, that that's a limited but useful source of information, but not have that the only <laughs> source of information that we go on when deciding suitable partners to be involved with. And that's why sometimes you, you know, a guy may be totally overboard about some particular woman and his friends are all, what is he saying to her? And this biological imperative is firing up <laughs> and he can't see past that. And the other thing is this, that, um, there's an element of competition comes into it when the biological imperative fires up because that uh, tends to cause us to see other men as competition. And then the other side of that is the biological imperative of a heterosexual male, the biological imperative, it doesn't really come into as being, so it's actually a good way of cultivating other aspects of our character and our aspects of our nature to do this, as I was saying, the, mentioning the brotherhood thing earlier, to being able to bond with other males in healthy ways, not just as beer buddies, drink buddies and sports buddies, but in a genuine form of connection, whether that's online or in person, and hopefully a bit of both. But, um, but to be able to have these genuine connections with other men in meaningful ways is really important as well, because it helps us to cultivate a broader range of feelings. Then in, if we do decide we're still into having uh, you know, if you're still into looking for a long-term partner partnership with a woman, then it'll actually broaden and enrich that relationship as well. So, and it makes us more likely and more able to maintain some kind of gold pill glow state. The gold pill glow will help us with every aspect of life. And if we kind of use that as a reference point, it can help us to enrich and improve any aspect of life. Part of the challenge of, of creating and maintaining the gold pill glow is to be able to detach somewhat from the responses that will arise from the biological comparative because they can really affect how we see ourselves and how we define ourselves and how we define uh, and shape our relationship with other people, not only women but other men in our lives. And we may decide, okay, I'm interested in some kind of more philosophical approach to life but then we, we meet a certain person, <laughs> next thing you know, our, our whole nervous system is being flooded by hormones <laughs> because of, of an attraction to a specific person. It doesn't mean we need to repress those feelings because repression is probably is not usually a good idea anyway. But we can look to how to redirect them and broaden them a bit so we're not expecting too much of this other person. And then there's the whole psychological aspect is 
because what happens, not only do we have the biological imperative firing up when we, as a heterosexual guy, meets an attractive female, there's all the psychological functions that happen as well. The way Carl Jung puts it, um, a man projects his ideal image of the feminine onto that woman. So this is an ideal uh, image of the feminine that doesn't arise from his personal experience. It's uh, what Jung calls an archetype, it's a deep image. It's a, an image of the perfect feminine. And when he meets a certain type of woman, he sees her as being that archetype. He sees her as being this, this anima, this idealized female. So he's not actually seeing her. He's actually seeing, uh, actually seeing an aspect of himself and projecting it outwards. And the way psychological projection works is we project parts we repress or don't accept in ourselves onto other people. And those parts can be the bad bits we don't want to accept, but it can also be the good bits we don't want to accept. And the, the Jung model of psychology, and um, in many cultures of the world, it's considered that there's a, there's a feminine aspect within the males and there's a male aspect within females. And part of our job is, as maturing individuals to, is to take ownership and help those aspects mature. Our initial experience is in inhabiting a male-type body, if we've got a male-type core energy, is to learn to work with male qualities like... Uh, um, like the more the dynamic, assertive, courage and boldness type of qualities. And then later on begin to integrate some of the more feminine aspects. It doesn't need to, it doesn't need to be 50-50. It's, it's more um, an element, need to, those elements will help kind of balance us. But once we get a certain maturity as a male, we can begin to integrate and mature the female aspects of ourselves. But initially as we connect with those elements, we might be a bit immature around our feminine aspect. So the guy is not actually seeing the woman in front of him. What he's seeing is a, 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 her and overlaid with an image of the perfect female. And if she's like, like a passive uh, type of individual, at least a blank canvas for him to project anything he likes onto her. I mean, how many times have you kind of gotten to know somebody or how many guys do you know who even get married to somebody and, and a year or two later says, I had no idea who had married, you know, because that was a projection. Every the person he met, fell in love with, had <laughs> married, was a combination of the biological imperative firing up and then a whole overlay of uh, projecting his ideal female onto her. And we instinctively uh, pick up on what other people are expecting of us. So the women may well have modeled some of, may well put on some of those the expected behaviors to fit in with what the guy was looking for. So it's, uh, it's a bit of an instinct there. But then the true person begins to come out later and it turns out to be something completely different from what, from what we thought we were seeing. So how do we know that we can generally hold to the gold pill glow and not drift into the fog of blue pill, the, the blue pill fog? Because after all, the, the red stage is quite useful. It acts as a reminder of not to do that again hold on to it to make sure we don't make the same mistakes and don't get drawn into the same uh, same situation and anger and rage are a sign usually within us that we need to create a boundary if we're going to step away from being enraged then we need to have something that we, that we can build up trust in that we know is going to help us maintain a new level of awareness without needing to have the rage and anger to do that for us other aspects of dysfunctional behavior that we can be susceptible to that fit in the whole blue pill thing are dysfunctional relationships, codependent behavior, that's where two people are entangled in an unhealthy relationship. We can be subject to illusions and glamorous illusions, which is where we're convinced that just because somebody's physically attractive, they're going to be attractive as a person, as a personality, and that are going to improve our lives, which is often a complete illusion. I mean, intellectually, we know that somebody's physical appearance has got nothing to do with their character. Our feelings can get triggered and we get lured into believing otherwise. <laughs> and so we fall into these illusions. The main challenge for guys who tend to get into the blue pill is we tend to be nice guys. But there's a good side to being a nice guy. There's a good side to being a kind and caring person. But the downside of that is we need wisdom to balance it. Without wisdom and knowledge, if we can really get sideswiped and pulled into unhealthy relationships and unhealthy situations. 
part of knowledge and wisdom is you have to know yourself. You have to know what your needs are. You have to know what your needs are, what your wants are. You have to know what's really important to you and to live by them, not sacrifice them to somebody else's life path. Because that's what got us into trouble in the first place was giving up things that are value to us in order to serve somebody else. It's good in a way to want to serve other people, but not of that other person that is purely being self-serving and just taking what we give and not really respecting it, not really valuing it. And it could be the pleasant physical appearance of the person is blinding us to the fact that they're not actually receiving it the way we think they're receiving it. They may not really be grateful or they may not really appreciate it and they just maybe always want more. If we're the source of provision for them and they don't know how to provide for themselves, then the, the demands or expectations are essentially endless. So the important thing is, is get to know yourself, get to understand yourself. As you get to know yourself, as you get to understand yourself, you begin to realize or hopefully realize that important part of it is you need to be able to be self-maintaining. You need to be able to do self-care and that includes your emotions and your thought patterns and be able to intervene if a strange mood comes up or if you wake up in the morning sometime and you've got a really strange mood you need to have techniques and methods that you can apply to help pull you out of that so as well as the wisdom and understanding to say wait a minute and I've got this funny mood today I feel kind of low and you need to be able to do self-care and a key to that is you need to be able to validate yourself if you can't validate yourself then you're going to always look for it outside you know, you need to be able to acknowledge to yourself when you did something good, when you did something well, and say to yourself, oh, I did a good job there. Or honestly go, well, I didn't do that well there, but I know how to do it better next time. Or, or I really totally blew that. I'll give it some careful thought and maybe get some advice or help or whatever and figure out what did I do wrong there. So in each way, in each, so in each aspect of that, you're affirming essentially that your capacity to learn and grow and to move through life in a positive and constructive way. So like your core assumption about yourself is you're essentially good and that you're moving in a good direction. And that sense of being essentially good and moving in a good direction will carry you through a lot of the challenges of life. So as I say, that's a really key element is being able to firm yourself in the ways that are meaningful to you. When we don't do that, then we're going to find, we're we'll going to be unconsciously looking for somebody else to do it. We're going to be looking for some special person to make us feel special and make us feel good about ourselves. But that isn't really ultimately what makes you feel good about yourself. It's you affirming you. In order to feel good about ourselves, we need the approval of the highest and best within us. Our own um, highest values, our own better self. And if it's your better self, it will not be unkind. It will not be harsh, it will not be critical. If it's harsh and critical, then it's probably somebody that influenced you from in your formative years. You've internalized somebody else's opinion of your opinion about life. You end up trying to run away from that and trying to contradict that. But it's, it's just part of the illusion. And so looking for and claiming the highest and best within you and what direction that part of you wants to go in, how it wants you to live your life, and getting to know that part and also getting to know the funny, quirky, odd parts of yourself and being okay with them. Being okay with the fact that sometimes you're going to be a bit odd and that's okay. <laughs> so what? Not looking for perfection, but just going continual self-improvement, continual progress. Every so often just being able to get it wrong <laughs> and it not being any big deal. It also really helps to have some kind of various practices. It can be a spiritual practice like meditation is really good. That helps a lot of men or prayer if you're a very religious kind of person, a really good connection with nature, holistic sense of yourself and your needs on different levels and to really be engaged with those and give focus to them rather than finding an other to fulfill you. Rather than trying to find somebody outside you to make you feel complete, look to what's inside you that can help you feel complete. Look to what's inside you that uh, helps you feel at peace with yourself. And maybe look more for serenity and peace and less for excitement and buzz. A peaceful, serene, graceful way of moving through life. So that you can kind of flow through life with a certain amount of grace and ease. Centered on what's highest and best within you. And what you see as being highest and best within life. So as you begin to 
explore these things and find ways to heal yourself. Self-healing practices like there's emotional freedom technique and meditation is also a healing practice in a way. There's Jinshin, which is a Japanese system of self-healing, NLP, the Neuro Linguistic Programming. There's all sorts of self-help, self-healing techniques that are around. Good to get to know at least about a handful of them and use them for different things in different situations. It could be even herbal things, whatever. See yourself as a whole person. Emotional needs, physical needs, mental needs, spiritual needs, however you define spiritual, and get yourself going in all those levels and give as much as you can of your time and intention to that. So you can back off a bit from the idea of making it in the world and just get to know you and get to be at peace with you. And then your actions in the world will be more beneficial. It'll be more beneficial to you and they'll be more beneficial to the people you interact with. The other thing about getting a handle of being self-affirming is to move away from self-criticism to self-encouragement. So rather than your general thought stream being one of, oh, you know, noticing what you've done wrong and giving yourself a hard time about it, it becomes self-encouraging. And that's when you start saying, well, I, I did that well, I did good. Start really noticing things that you do well. That's not going to make you arrogant because if you're really self-aware, you won't become arrogant through that because you'll still be noticing things that you could improve on. Practicing by having a, a good connection with the highest and best within you, you always have a sense of what the next step is for you. And also, the more readily you are to be able to encourage yourself, the more able you, you become to be able to encourage other people. When somebody else has done something really well and be able to tell them, wow, I think you did a great job there. I really like what you did there. I really like the way you did that. That protects you from becoming arrogant because arrogance is often driven by a sense of lack and trying to compensate for that sense of lack you lose this need to be special and different and just feel like well actually i'm okay the way i am i don't need to be special and different i can i'm actually at peace with me i'm peace with myself as i am i'm comfortable in my own skin and that will become more and more true for you a lot of the struggle and striving starts going out of life because there's nothing to struggle and strive for to express the highest and best within us we need to surrender to it we just need to let go of all the stuff it gets in the way <laughs> and not struggle and struggle to try and be something better so it's one of the paradoxes is um sometimes the less effort we put in to try and live out our best life and just really listen but start to really listen and accept what that is then the easier it becomes and the easier it becomes the more peaceful life becomes and the more flowing life becomes so don't become the kind of guy that feels like, oh, I don't need anybody, I can do everything on my own. Because it's really important for health and well-being to be able to network with other people. Because for one thing, as you're living out the highest and best within you, learning wisdom and knowledge and the skill to express the highest and best within you, you want to connect with other people because you'll have things to share with them. They'll be, you know, just naturally, spontaneously. And as you do that, you begin to find something else. You find something fascinating. The highest and best within you has got a very, very interesting qualities to it. And one of those qualities is beauty. As a man begins to acknowledge the highest and best within him, he stops projecting that onto other people. He stops projecting it onto women. So rather than seeing beauty in the women, he can see the beauty in the highest and best within him, especially as he's beginning to learn how to express it and how it wants to express in his life, and how it wants to ground in his life. So as you begin to find the highest and best within you and see, oh, where does this want me to go? Where's, which direction am I going in with this? Then you'll find this inner beauty. You wouldn't hunger for it as something outside. You wouldn't see it as something that's only outside you, because then you can see it in yourself and it'll feed you. It kind of feeds, because we need beauty. And one of the key essentials in life is beauty. So look for it in things that don't get you embroiled in unhappy and unhealthy relationships. You'll be more self-contained and you'll know what you're getting into and on the various ins and outs of that. So it's a bit ironic, but the more self-validating you become, the more self-contained you become, the more self-directed and self-determined you become, you may well find yourself actually more willing and able to reach out to other people. You don't really need them. You don't really need to get something from them. It's more like sharing your common humanity and just enjoying sharing your common humanity, sharing meaningful connections with other people. But it's a different tone than it would have had in the past because you've got stuff that you enjoy sharing. Of course, you might do that online, you might do it one-to-one, -one, whatever. But those aspects within yourself that will probably want to move outwards. And it might be for a time you really want to withdraw and contain and consolidate yourself. But then 
as you grow in the knowing of who you are and who you really are, not who you thought you were, then you can extend into other ways of relating. You've taken on various roles in life in order to function in the world. Certain roles associated with being a man and behaving in certain ways and having certain attitudes. You've found that, well, some of those actually don't work the way society has said they work. They don't actually have the payoff they said they would have. The upside of that is now you're free or you can choose to be free. I mean, you may have financial constraints and financial things you need to be dealing with on an ongoing basis, but inwardly you can become free. Live, live life in a less burdened way and to look to what do you really want? Rather than assuming what's going to give you fulfillment, look to what really gives you fulfillment, what really serves you. And when I say what really serves you, I mean what serves the highest and best within you, not the self-indulgent self that just gets locked into me, 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 me and becomes completely self-serving because that isn't going to line up with what's the highest and best within you. So we need to get really grounded in being self-validating, being self-encouraging, seeing those as aspects of wisdom and knowledge and skill and how to move through life, find ways to express the capacity within us to serve others in a way that doesn't lock us into blue pill, dysfunctional, codependent, whatever you want to call it. So, so if you get anchored in the highest and the best within you, that's what will keep you in a good direction, a healthy direction. It is really possible to let go of any kind of rage and anger around certain things that we've woken up to in life to do with the red pill and begin to cultivate this glow. But the glow really comes from you. It really comes from your connection with the highest and best within you. It comes from you knowing who you really are. And who you really are may, will turn out to be something much better and much different than who you thought you were. Because you've learned certain ideas and concepts from society that are just as illusionary as the ones you got into uh, that you then woke up from in Red Pill Rage. There's other layers of illusion that we fall into. The highest and best within you is your guide out of that, out of those illusions to what your real potential is, what your real actual is, and what will really fulfill you. So this aspect of you, this uh, what I'm referring to as your highest and best within you, will lead you into ways of being able to serve others without losing yourself in the process. It will strengthen yourself and you will expand yourself into it. When we're in the blue pill state, the unconscious state, the illusionary state, we tend to lose ourselves in unhealthy ways. We tend to weaken ourselves in the service of others and do it through struggle and striving. But when you're operating from this higher aspect of yourself, then you're, you grow into serving others and you realize that this serving of others is really serving you in many ways. You're strengthening your connection with the higher aspects of yourself and the deeper aspects of yourself, so it's incredibly fulfilling. So you're not doing it to get something, you're not doing it to gain something, you're not doing it to get approval, you're not doing it to get validation, you're doing it because it's who you are. And the more that's who you are, the less you need validation and approval, because you're getting it from yourself. You've got the approval of your, the highest and best within you, so what more do you need? There are very definite challenges to reaching a stage of goal, pill, glow and being able to hold it and maintain it. Well, the opportunities and the challenges all come within ourselves. They all come in what shape does the biological imperative take when it fires up inside us? What shape does it take when we project our idealized image of the feminine onto, onto a woman and, and then get attracted to somebody who's not actually like that, <laughs> but maybe pretending to be like a bit like that? Because that's part of what the biological imperative is going to do to them, is to get them to, to sense and to fit in with what we're looking for. That's partly the way biological imperative is going to function in members of the opposite gender, is to fit in with expectations up to a point. And until it becomes no longer necessary, but like so we got married or the first child is born and then the pretense stops and it's okay, it's get real time. So it's not the women's fault that we project things. You know, we can't really fault people for that because we're running on our psychological projections and our biological imperative. So we can't really blame other people for doing the same thing, for running on their, their projections and their biological imperative. In order to be really in the goal pill glow, we need to become a self-determining individual. So our lives are not governed by uh, psychological projections and not governed by the biological imperative. We can't really master any aspect of life until we've learned some mastery of ourselves. So some of the things we need 
is there's a need for beauty. We need beauty and to cultivate a relationship with beauty. And that can be done through nature, through art, through whatever. But if we don't develop or cultivate that sense of a need for beauty in life, then and we'll just only see it through members of the opposite gender and we'll only see it in them. You know, we're just setting ourselves up for trouble down the line. So I think it's really important to have an appreciation of beauty, appreciation of art, uh, appreciation of the good things of life in a nice, broad, varied way. So in the capacity to enjoy, you know, the word enjoy means to make joy. And so the capacity to take pleasure in life is essential. See, people sometimes make happiness a goal. I think it's better to actually make the goal the things that bring happiness. And that's a constructive sense of purpose, feeling good about yourself, feeling good about your life, feeling good about the direction you're going in, feeling like you're improving yourself and building on yourself and getting yourself healthier and fitter if you need to do that, developing physical skills, mental skills, developing whatever seems to you to be the next step, and developing and cultivating that. The gold pill glow is beginning to know yourself better outside all of these roles you've played in life. Whereas a um, macho guy or a soft guy or a you know a go getter or you know even negative things you've taken on like oh I'm a loser or whatever, just letting go of all of that and beginning to discover yourself as outside of the games that society and the labels that society set up and seeing yourself as a independent self-determining individual to take responsibility for that and how you want to shape your life, how you want to shape the direction of your life. And of course, you can be inspired by what other people are doing, but don't look up to them too much because you need to look to the creativity within yourself and the abilities within yourself and to look to people who help awaken your own sense of power and ability and effectiveness. You know, it can be useful to have a few heroes you know, along the way but don't give too much to them because um, it's about empowering you, not about think, deciding how amazing they are. So really you want to have role models that encourage you to see how awesome you are, not have role models that encourage you to see how awesome they are. So a bit of that's okay, but it's really about you discovering your own awesomeness or even not even awesomeness, just okayness, you know, <laughs> just be okay, you know. So not struggling and striving to be awesome, but just say, okay, I'm okay. I'm okay. It's fine to be okay. And let life be the adventure that it's meant to be. Like discovering your nature um, and your own creativity is one of the keys to that. And, and let that unfold as it is. If you, if you look inside yourself to discover your own nature, you discover it's an ongoing unfolding, it's an unfolding mystery or the mystery of yourself. You've got untapped abilities, um, unexplored capacities. And so just accept that fact that it's inside you, this mysterious being, and just really explore that and have fun with it. See, we tend to create an image of ourselves, a self-image, an image of who we are, based on what other people have told us and based on um, parts of this that have emerged as we're go through life but also part of that we 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 learn to repress certain aspects of ourselves certain parts of us may not be acceptable within the social framework that we grew up in and so we learn to push some aspects down there's gold in them their hills as they say there's there's gold in the parts of us that we've pushed down maybe somebody who's who's um got caught up in a, a, a being a bit too assertive has pushed down their more softer aspects those can over, offer value in the, in the way of appreciating your beauty and, and being able to be creative because creativity is one of the keys to the gold pill glow. You may find there's parts of you that you've pushed down in the past and they might start to come up again that actually will offer you incredible value as you learn to integrate them and bring them into your character and smooth off the rough edges and uh, but so don't just chuck them away because oh that's not a good part of me it's got too many rough edges look at how can i integrate that how can i make it part of me so we tend to create a sense of self and define ourselves a lot from what other people have come up with and just it's really good to find out who you really are what's real about you some of the parts of your you're hiding might actually be really valuable you may need to play with them a little bit just to find out well what what is useful in this 
because even a painful experience that we've had in the past can offer a lot of wisdom. But if we just freeze it and don't absorb it in our life experience consciously, then we don't learn the wisdom from it. All it is is a frozen experience. So it's important sometimes, you know, not to dwell too much in the past, but in the present moment if something's coming up, to bring it into, into the now and, and integrate it and deal with it. You know, life's a buffet. <laughs> just go for it. One of the things that I think is really positive about the manosphere is how often men are encouraged to have a purpose, to have a good, clear, strong purpose in life. I go along with that. I think it's one of the fundamental things in life. One of the fundamental aspects of having a positive and constructive life is to be aligned with some kind of purpose. And I would say, I would go as far as to say it, making it a positive purpose, something that expresses your highest values. It doesn't even necessarily need to directly connect with how you earn your living, though if you can join the two up where you're kind of earn your living through a way that really aligns with your highest values, then fantastic. But just let me tell you briefly what happened to me, how I find something of real value that's really making a big difference to my life. And it happened while I was going through divorce, going through this whole separation divorce thing. And as that was happening, went through various stages of, 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 of grief and anger and rage and all the usual things. And as that was going on, I began to feel like, well, I'm feeling all this energy, feeling all these feelings, all this potential movement, potential action. And I'd like to find a positive way to express this. How can I take all this angst and channel it in a constructive way. Now, sometimes, of course, I just needed to be feeling sad and upset or angry or whatever. But other times I felt, well, it's gone on long enough. <laughs> I want to move now. I want to get out about and do something. And, uh, you know, and sometimes I would just retreat into myself and deal with it. And sometimes I would talk to friends about it. But I wanted more than that. And then I began to have an idea. And it was more like a picture would pop into my mind as I was having this feeling of, well, how, how can, what can I do with this? What can I do that's constructive? What can I do to express all this energy in a way that helps somebody at something somewhere that's useful? And in Scotland, we've got a lot of areas, um, a lot of areas that are fairly barren. They're mostly just covered in heather that used to be forest. Uh, we used to have these forests and, and people came and chopped them down. So anyway, it really bothered me that we weren't treating nature very well. So I was getting this image coming into my mind of somebody walking through this moorland, these kind of wild kind of places with a stick and planting trees with a stick. And I thought, you know, it's a bit like the story of the man who planted trees. It was a little bit like that, but it was much quicker <laughs> because the seeds were going into the stick and coming out straight into the ground. I thought, oh, somebody must have, must be something like that available. So I searched around and found that some things were roughly like that, but not exactly what I wanted. Because anyway, to cut a long story short, I had this idea, well, why don't I just get a metal walking stick, make a hole in the top for the seeds, cut and reshape the bottom bit so it becomes a blade, and remove anything inside the tube that stops the seeds going through. And I, I tried that, and it worked. So I could put 500 tree seeds in the ground in an hour while having a leisurely walk <laughs> <laughs> out in the moorlands in the Highland area. And I did a whole video about that and how it can be adapted to different situations. But the main thing is, it was how to convert that um, sense of grieving, of, of anger, of disappointment, and to transform it into something positive, constructive. That's a really fun thing to do. Uh, people's eyes light up when, when I show them how to do it. It's very satisfying, it's very fulfilling, and it really helps benefit the planet. I'm going to be launching a project to spread that. But anyway, the main thing is we can turn this time, the time of, of pain and grieving and anger into something beneficial, into something transformative that transforms us and helps make the world a little bit better place. Our pain and angst doesn't just need to be pain and angst. It can become something more. So that was a way that I gained a positive purpose, a new purpose, and a new direction and it came in a way directly out of all the angst I was going through and looking for a way I could contain that and redirect it constructively. So the very thing that's hurting us can be the very thing that actually improves our lives because we use it as fuel, we use that energy as fuel 
for creating a better life for ourselves. Using the pain and the angst to create a better life and looking for a way to direct that that helps improve society and bingo, you, then what happens is your own highest values can, can, can come in and will help you. You're kind of the highest and best within you will be on your side really seriously, seriously on your side anyway, they can really reach you then, it can really begin to direct you to a new and better way of living. So it's not just about change, you can actually be transforming because your character begins to change, your attitude begins to change, your life begins to change, and you can, you know, and look back and the, the whole divorce thing is, oh, actually, it worked out the best for you. <laughs> See, well, maybe I would have rather not gone through all of that, but it's actually worked out for the best. It's actually enabled me to have a new and better life. It's actually helped me wake up and realize, you know, I could have spent another 20, 30, whatever years and struggling and struggling to try and make something work. And now I can let all that go, have a new, fresh take on life, have a new, fresh approach to life and a new enjoyment of life that, that is not dependent on somebody else not dependent on somebody else being happy. It's not dependent on me making somebody else happy. It's about having a positive, constructive purpose and living by that. And it can be multiple purposes with expecting different aspects of your life. So I hope that whatever's going on for you at the present time, that you can find ways to channel it constructively and to use it to, to nourish yourself and to allow the best within you to expand and grow and get to know the, what's good, what's true and what's beautiful in yourself. So this whole aspect of having a, a constructive positive purpose that brings meaning to your life is really, really important because that keeps you going when, when things go rocky in other areas of your life. Having a positive purpose and direction gives you self-respect and self-respect can override everything. Even if you're lacking confidence and maybe not feeling that good about yourself at a particular time. In terms of being able to have this sense of gold pill glow, where there's a, generally speaking an overall sense of, of contentment and happiness and feeling fulfilled in your life, I think positive purpose is one of the key elements to the gold pill glow. Forgiveness and the gold pill glow. Forgiveness can include goodbye. It's important to know that there's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. And it's the confusion between the two that sometimes blocks people from the idea of forgiving. They think that they can't really forgive because they're going to have to reconcile with this person. But as I like to say, forgiveness can include goodbye. Forgiveness helped me a lot when I was going through my own divorce process. And it was one of the things that helped pull me out of it, put me out of the painful side of that much quicker than I might have otherwise. I teach forgiveness and um, got quite a popular website on called the Global Forgiveness Initiative. So thankfully I had that as a background when I was going through a divorce and well, first the separation then the divorce and all the, the mess that that brought. But it really helped me to let go of the resentment, to let go of the situation and not to be caught up in anger and bitterness, but to free myself to find my own direction in life. We can gain more from an experience when we when we can forgive it because then we begin the wisdom and the insights from the experience rather than simply being bitter and angry. We can learn things from it, we can learn and move on rather than just being stuck in the pain of the past. What stops a lot of people forgiving is that they simply don't have a method. So this combination of people not having a method, not knowing how to forgive, not having a specific technique and secondly getting a bit confused about the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation and feeling like, well, I don't want to go back into that situation again, so I can't forgive them, which is not true. You can forgive and decide not to get back together with this person. And in fact, the forgiveness makes it less likely you'll make the same mistake again. It just clears the whole thing up and you get a much clearer picture of what actually happened and your role in it and their role in it and how to not create the same thing again, whatever direction you decide to take in your life for the future. So the main thing to realize with forgiveness is it sets you free, that forgiveness gives you an internal freedom. It gives you the internal freedom to begin to look at how events affect you rather than simply being at the effect of events and then having to deal with the repercussions. You can check out the website the globalforgivenessinitiative.com. There's a free ebook on there, it spells the whole thing out. So that combined with the 
the videos I've done should give you pretty much a clear understanding of how to do it and I've got material on there in about 26 different languages now so the website gets like about 3 million hits a year so for a topic like forgiveness that's quite radical so it's really working really well the forgiveness thing is really taking off and really doing well and I just give it away for free I just want to share it with people get people to be able to use it to improve their lives so so please check it out now one of the soft skills I think it really helps is to have is the ability to give ourselves our own approval because if we can't give ourselves our own approval what tends to happen is we tend to become needy because it's an important part of our social wiring is to be approved of so we can fit in and be valued in that society so if we can give ourselves our own approval at least part of the time we can derive some of it from externals but essentially also we need to be able to give ourselves our own approval if others are not available for for our, for giving us that it helps us to, to, to have a certain amount of independence from from external circumstances so what happens if we can't give ourselves our own approval we very easily slide we can all too easily slide into the whole well the typical beta male as it's called mentality or the the nice guy mentality where we're constantly having to be nice or falling over ourselves to to meet the needs of other people often women and hoping they will approve of us for it they are sensing we don't approve of ourselves so they're feeling like oh this they're thinking to themselves well if this guy thinks there's something wrong with him maybe there is something wrong with him why does he doubt himself so much so it's really important to have the mechanism within us to say you know I did a good job there I did that right or I made a good effort I really blew it, it turned out a mess but I made a good effort you know 10 out of 10 for effort <laughs> it's a bit of humorous self-approval this can go a long way and instead of always being down on ourselves and being self-critical and all of that kind of stuff it and because um, nobody can really thrive in an atmosphere of negative criticism all the time so don't do it to yourself and don't let other people do it to you so um and the first step in stopping other people doing it is to stop doing it to yourself so you know look out for any part of you that's, that's self-negating and self-condemning and just say wait a minute who is that where is that coming from is that like somebody in your formative years who you've internalized their way of looking at things you've internalized their way of looking at you and um, they might have had a very acerbic caustic and cynical view of life and you might have taken it on board and you've got this constant critic <laughs> instead of negative self-talk as they call it and break out of that and take responsibility for your relationship with yourself so that it's it's not a negative one is your relationship with yourself positive or negative is it helpful and constructive or are you putting yourself down because if you put yourself down then you weaken yourself it's like imagine somebody who couldn't run very well and then they're going to beat themselves in the leg with a stick because they're not running very well it's what well how can you run better by crippling yourself yeah so it's like there's a form of of um self you know too much self-criticism is, is a form of self-harm it's not going to help you become any better it's not going to build up your self-esteem praising yourself if it's not realistic make it humorous <laughs> so there's a good energy in it so it's like the relationship with yourself has good energy playful energy not heavy serious oh i never get it right well oh come on you know we need to you know lighten up around ourselves not be too judgmental not be too heavy if you're not fun for you to be around for yourself how can you be fun to be around for other people so we need to be fun to be around for yourself you need to be playful with yourself and you need to enjoy being yourself know something about you that you enjoy being and enjoy and expand it more the more you enjoy it the more you do that bit uh, this positive reinforcement of the good and the best you know, encourage the best in yourself will make best of you grow that's how it works berating yourself and judging yourself and criticizing yourself and always looking at what you do wrong is our useless activity you know once you've got a basic sense of dealing well with yourself and dealing with yourself in healthy ways and correcting yourself in healthy ways just being being able to really honest I mean, when you really mess up do you go oh, okay i really messed up but not beating yourself up when you mess up don't beat yourself up but correct yourself lift yourself up don't beat yourself up you know move positively and then you become much less needy for other people to give you uh, approval and to um, be much more okay I'm, I'm okay with me 
and you want to hang out with people who are also okay with you. And that makes for a much more pleasant life and is an essential part of the gold pill glow. Creativity is one of these things that really helps with gold pill glow. Because as you learn to tap into and express your creativity, it's very fulfilling. You know, you might find yourself with a particular problem or an issue or something you're working with. Learn to be open to your creativity and the ideas that come and learn to work with those in constructive ways. Because some of the initial ideas might be a bit wacky and a bit crazy, but then you play around with them and then you can, you can unravel them and, and blend them together or whatever until you get end up with a really good idea and um, something very workable. So it's one of the keys to life, I feel, to having a fulfilling life is being able to have enough, have a good enough relationship with your creativity that you can let ideas flow. You might be just write them down on paper or whatever, or brainstorm them with somebody else. And um, But it's a process. It's not like every idea is going to be brilliant and every idea is going to work. You need to work with it. You need to um, play with it. Play with creativity. Have room to play and uh, not take it too seriously and too heavily but uh, have space for the whole playful aspect of creativity can really add juice to life and it can even add a bit of brightness and color to the just the mundane act of going through life is just find more creative ways of living anything and everything creativity can touch any aspect and every aspect of life and help alive in it and make it more colorful and make it more enjoyable a great habit to cultivate it's just, okay, how can I approach this a bit more creatively? How can I make this a bit more fun? How can I make this a bit lighter? And not getting all dour and serious, you know, too much about stuff. See, we need the, the creativity to balance out a sense of purpose. So we need the sense of purpose to give us direction in life. However, we also need a sense of playfulness to access creativity. If we're trying to be purposeful and we're trying to find solutions so we can make whatever this purpose is real and to be able to do something about it, it's important for the playfulness to offset it. Otherwise, we're going to get too serious, too uptight, and we're going to really miss the new ideas and freshness that can help make it more workable, more effective. I mean, if we get too serious and too heavy, it can be more difficult to attract other people to help us with our projects, and we might need some help with our projects. So creativity, one of the keys, I feel, to uh, the gold pill glow. I mean, in creativity in the broadest sense of the term, touch every aspect of life, not just the creative arts, not just painting and music, and, but creativity in every aspect of life. Just in, you know, being creative around what you have for breakfast in the morning, you know, not always the same thing, but just spice it up a bit, change it a bit, you know. Just. Now, this leads to an important topic to do with gold pill glow. And it's a tricky one. And that's the topic of love. And what does that mean in terms of the gold pill glow? And how do we approach it? Well, let me give you an example of what we don't do. In the past, you might have looked at a woman or assuming you're a heterosexual guy, or you might have looked at a woman or whatever your, your gender equivalent of that is. And I come to feeling like, oh, she's so wonderful, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I suggest that that's not really it. That's not really a good state to be in. Because to genuinely love somebody, you need to be able to see their faults and their foibles and their quirks and oddities fully and still love them from a centered space not from a space of ex ex expectation that there, it's going to be a dream come true and all of that. Because any healthy relationship challenges us. It challenges the parts of us in ways we haven't matured. And we've all got space for being challenged and learning to mature. So she is so wonderful and it's all oh, so wonderful and it's going to be also wonderful. That's the romantic thing, or tends to be the romantic thing that's got a lot of the biological imperative influencing us, our hormones firing away and, and getting us all excited and interested in somebody. And being excited and interested in somebody isn't necessarily anything to do with love. It's just part of your system powering up because it sees a potential mate, a bearer of children, ding, and, <laughs> and flooding you with happy hormones to get you to follow through on the impulses that the biological imperative wants you to follow through on. We need to be able to see other people as they really are 
and still love them. And that takes time and it takes cultivating a certain level of maturity. And it takes many of the other things I talk about in this video about learning to be able to be your own source of approval so that when these things fire up in you, you're not trying to, oh, I have to know when this person's approval, da, 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 da. Learning to be at peace with yourself, including your own faults and foibles and learning to encourage yourself through self-encouragement rather than self-criticism. And having a realistic form of self-encouragement rather than just self-criticism where you can realistically look at what you did wrong, but not being down on yourself, but also encourage yourself around the stuff you do right and encourage yourself to doing more of what you do right and having your attention on what you do right so you'll do more of it. Because we tend to do more of what our attention is on. So if we're putting an attention on the ways we criticize ourselves or down ourselves, we just do more. And that's being um, unloving of yourself when we do that. You don't have a healthy, loving type relationship with yourself. You can't really do it with anybody else because all you're gonna do is criticize, criticize, criticize. And then when you meet the other, you're going to project this ideal image onto this person. You're seeing the other as perfect because they're this beautiful, ideal, ideal person. But meanwhile, you're being heavily criticizing yourself. That just doesn't work. That's not healthy. And the more you criticize yourself, the probably the more you're going to project what's good about you onto somebody else and see it in them because you can't see it in yourself. So this kind of love state um, isn't necessarily what we think it is. So love becomes, so love is a, obviously a very broad thing. And it's interesting though that the guys of the race, the various beings who have, have represented different world religions or, uh, or important philosophies and so on, they, they all, none of them say that love is an illusion. They say that we walk in illusions, and I've done a whole video on, on romantic love and illusions. But they say we walk in illusions, but they don't say love is an illusion. And um, so since the guides of the race are saying it's love is not an illusion, it's actually an essential part of the underlying reality of, of the universe and whatever. So, oh, okay. So I think that bears listening to and bears, bears taking a note of. And the, the, the wiser beings that have tried to influence us for, the, for, a higher, for a higher reasons and for noble purposes basically say that. But we don't really understand what love is. At our level of evolution, but it leads us to something very important and uh, and essential and f having a fulfilling life. So, so we need to be aware of the love and the potential of love and the possibility of love, but not seeing it purely in romantic terms, not seeing it a bit as just being about members of the opposite gender, but being able to love more broadly, to fall in love with life itself and love the beauty of life and love nature and love good stuff and love good food ever ever whatever whatever awakens your heart and your capacity to love and to honor that and to follow that and um and not assume because the whole romantic thing love is much broader than that and to find out what that is for you and not become like a hard bitten cynic around the whole love thing but to be open to rediscovering it anew without the biological imperative overlaying how you see it and without your projecting of your idealized feminine onto somebody else getting in the way. But you'll be able to see much more clear eyed and uh, into discovering more of what the, this whole love thing really is.